Okay. Um, well, as Kate introduced me, I don't have to introduce myself. And yes, I work as a veterinarian. And please excuse and or forgive the American accent. Um, but I was born with it or I learned it early in life and can't get rid of it. Um, I call this the usual suspects because it seems that whenever someone is having sort of difficult or obscure problems with their animals, uh, we all tend to blame minerals and sometimes minerals are the case and we round up these usual suspects that I've uh, listed here and sometimes minerals aren't necessarily the case and I think when they aren't the case knowing a bit more about um, minerals and their unique characteristics helps us to understand why they may or may not be uh, at fault for livestock problems um, and why they are important for keeping optimum health in your livestock. So to begin with, um, Keep in mind that minerals are complicated. We'll go through a lot of little details here, and some things may seem contradictory, um, but if you're confused, don't panic. Um, even experts on minerals are confused. Sometimes the more we learn and the more we get to know, the less we find we actually understand. So um, if you can understand this, you've been in school too long, and um, if you don't understand it, you're more like the rest of us, even though I've had to memorize it at some point in time. But it does relate to minerals, just how uh, interactive they are. Because everything is so complicated, I want you to focus on the fact that some deficiencies are very common, and we see them quite frequently. And when you're starting out trying to understand how minerals act in livestock, start focusing on those common, big, obvious deficiencies, the big minerals like what we're talking about tonight. And don't worry about the weird, the wild, and the wonderful. It'll just get you confused until you're sometime down the road and have learned to understand the common then the weird and wonderful will make a little bit more sense. So just focus on the big things. Uh, the things we hit tonight are a lot of them. And uh, start with that and you'll learn more as you go. And the reason that I say that it's complicated and to not worry too much about some of the niggly bits is that where you are and what kind of animals you have will affect your mineral issues. And I say soil type is a big indi uh, not indicator, big uh, factor in what kind of mineral problems, either excess or deficiency, you may see in your animals. And soil type varies wildly um, across both North and South Island, um, and sometimes even within a property. And those knowing those kinds of interactions requires quite a bit of expertise. So just sort of let it go and know that it's not always going to follow the rules that you want and, and we come back to the fact that minerals are complicated. So starting out with the times when we check for mineral problems. This isn't necessarily when you need to check, but just some ideas of when we commonly as veterinarians uh, start looking at minerals in uh, people's livestock. So we'll use uh, a mineral check to uh, investigate whether or not a supplement is doing what it should be doing. I had a client recently who she can't get a hold of her, uh, she has dairy goats, very large goat dairy. Uh, she can't get a hold of the mineral that she's been using for years and years. And so she kind of wanted to see where her animals were at um, and then decide on the new mineral um, plan based on where they're at and what they need. Uh, another time that we often check minerals is when one may be having to give multiple supplements. So, for example, selenium is pretty universally deficient across New Zealand. And so knowing this, selenium gets kind of lumped into a lot of animal treatments. So you can get selenized uh, vaccines for lambs. You can get... Uh, drenches, injectable drenches and oral drenches with selenium in it. You can get plain selenium and selenium's in a lot of mineral mixes. And so if you happen to be doing multiple things and they all have selenium in, in them, you can very 
quickly go from uh, a deficiency, which would be normal, to adequacy, to excess. And excess selenium can be toxic and very dangerous. So it's good to know where your animals are at before adding or changing supplements, and especially when using multiples. We also check for mineral problems when we start to have some suspicion of there being a deficiency in the herd. And this can be kind of subtle and a little bit difficult for lifestyle farmer situations where you only have maybe two or three of a species of animals or five or six or even up to 20. It's still relatively a small number. So we we act on hunches and those hunches um, as veterinarians or experts in animal nutrition uh, we follow reoccurring problems and we look at maybe this has been going on for a while and that could be related to minerals um, and, and try to be a little bit of a detective to come up with, with what minerals we suspect and whether or not we think it's worth spending money on uh, checking minerals in your livestock. Uh, it's frequently a good idea to check mineral ad adequacy before periods of high stress. Uh, we know that calving and lambing um, and, and lactation, if you have milking cattle or goats, milking goats, is really a high stress period for animals, and that's when they're going to be needing the most minerals. Uh, they just, minerals are used in things like energy metabolism, building bones, such as when they're gestating a lamb or, or, or having growing a calf in their belly, so they need more minerals. Uh, winter is also a period of stress. Uh, food's not as good as it is in the summertime. The weather's a bit colder. Oftentimes for cattle and goats, they're pregnant. So knowing what your mineral levels are going into these periods can help you to make decisions about supplementation. Uh, spend your money wisely in supplementation and not over supplement your animals all hopefully with the goal of getting really good performance and production out of those animals and having your cows produce nice big calves without too much difficulty, not having metabolic problems, et cetera, et cetera. It goes on and on. And the last reason I thought of uh, for mineral, checking out your minerals is if you're showing animals, um, either showing horses or say you're showing something fun and fancy like chickens or rabbits or or showing your, your cattle, uh, knowing that your minerals are not only adequate but really optimum can be kind of an interesting way of bringing out the, just that really nice shine and bloom on your animals for show. And as you'll see here shortly, a lot of minerals are involved in the skin and the hair coat, and that's of course what you see in the show ring. And so having optimum mineral levels can really uh, make animals look beautiful. So this is some ideas to have in the back of your mind as to when you may want to look at the adequacy of things like selenium and magnesium and copper and all those usual suspects that we talk about. And the first and most common thing that we, that starts to tip us off that we want to look at mineral levels is, is coat color and texture or the behavior of, co of the coat of the animal. It's not the only thing, but it's a, a quick and dirty thing. It's really obvious because the animal's right there and we can get an idea uh, that there might be an issue that we need to look into a little bit more deeply. I know this picture is really faded so that you can see the text in front of it, but you can sort of see this calf in the background. It's a little bit smaller than her, her herd mate in the back, um, a bit scruffy looking, uh, scruffy around the ears. The, the coat's just not as nice, lovely color as they're probably back, black Angus, and uh, she's really nice and lovely in, black, in back, in black. Um, they're both a little bit skinny, but this one's even skinnier. So it's just that kind of their indication that there's actually probably a mineral issue going on in both these animals and the rest of the herd. Uh, just it happens to be that this little girl is maybe a bit more susceptible because of behavior. She's not eating as much or the same stuff. Um, or genetics, she's, she's a little bit prone to needing higher levels of minerals. You start to see that you want to investigate the whole herd because uh, this girl back here is probably going to experience some mineral deficiencies soon um, when she gets into periods of stress. We see 
poor resistance to problems that should otherwise not be an issue for animals. This is things like in horses, mud fever comes up, um, and it comes up in times of the year when they shouldn't be getting it. So it's not uncommon to have mud fever, and this big fancy word dermatophilus here, those two are the same thing. This is just usually what we call it in cattle, and this is what we call it in horses. It's a bacterial skin infection. It occurs when animals have a breakdown in their uh, immunity of some kind, a little bit of an immune compromise, either from stress or insufficient nutrition. Um, and the bacteria that's normally there, normally harmless, has an opportunity to take over uh, mineral minerals because there are many of them involved in the skin and the hair coat and uh, the immune system can lead to these problems. So if I'm seeing mud fever in a horse and it's the wrong time of year, like a nice warm dry summer, uh, the horse isn't wearing a cover on a regular basis, uh, I start to think mm, maybe we should look at selenium. Uh, feet and unexplained lameness in both cattle and horses is sometimes an indicator that we need to be looking at mineral issues, again, because those, those minerals are components of, of the skin and the hair and the bones. And if an animal is frequently getting a lot of infections that just don't clear up, aren't responding to antibiotics like they should, um, certain infections just should really be easily cured with antibiotics. Yes, there's always issues of, of resistant bacteria, but there's also infections that should just be easily solved. Your veterinarian will tell you which these are, and if they're not curing um, like they should be, start looking at underlying problems for that sort of immune compromise, not, not doing as well. The whole complex to dig together we kind of call ill thrift, which doesn't mean a whole lot except your sheep aren't doing well and they look kind of crap. Uh, as we said before, bad feet, bad mane, tail. If you have wool-producing sheep, uh, you'll see breaks in the wool, which of course lowers your the value of your wool, whether you're doing uh, fancy hand-spinning type sheep, uh, fancy breeds, or doing commercial wool. It'll lower the value and usefulness of your wool. Um, and just generally bad hair, skin, and coat is a big indicator that there's probably low-grade chronic problems going on. Now not all broken bones absolutely indicate that there's a problem with an animal's minerals, but broken bones when they shouldn't be broken, so a cow just walking along all of a sudden breaks an arm bone, uh, we start thinking about copper deficiency and or zinc deficiencies and that kind of thing, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, because copper is very important in the building of bone uh, and, and our, as are a couple other minerals, uh, copper and calcium being the most important minerals. Uh, if, if these aren't right, the bone doesn't get formed correctly and it breaks under stresses that shouldn't normally break bones. So we start getting suspicious if we see those weird things there. Interestingly, chronic diarrhea can be a, an indicator that there's a a mineral problem in a herd or a flock. Um, and most commonly, diarrhea is due to parasites, especially in young animals. They're really prone to parasites. So if, if you know that you are good with your drenches, you've been keeping up regularly, or uh, in an effort to avoid drench resistance, you're doing regular fecal egg counts, that's what FEC stands for, and your fecal egg counts are low and therefore not explaining a chronic diarrhea, maybe think about mineral deficiency because copper and some of the others can cause sort of a chronic diarrhea. Alternatively, if the animal's health and well-being, sort of like the issues we were talking up uh, higher up the list, are leading to animals that are weaker and poor immune system, they can get overgrowth of bacteria in the, the intestines that causes them to have diarrhea. So it's kind of two or three layers deep. And again, reinforces why I say it's complicated. Um, never hesitate to ask uh, experts for advice. Uh, vets in New Zealand really kind of love to, to address minerals. I think we do a good job of it here in New Zealand, especially compared to my experience in um, America. And so there's lots of good experts out there who can help you. 
uh, keep in mind that minerals are just tricky and it can sometimes be, be hard to really nail down a diagnosis. Lab results will give you a lot of information, but they may not give you um, a black and white answer, especially if you only have one to two animals. Just the sample size isn't big enough, but there's no reason because of that to not do a little bit of investigation and see what you can find. It can still give you a lot of information even if it's not a clear black and white answer. So how to investigate uh, minerals in animals? Uh, liver analysis is our favorite and our gold standard for particular minerals. It's great for copper, um, a little bit for selenium, um, and zinc is also really good. But most of the time, we're getting it out of animals that are going for slaughter. Either if you sell something to the meat works, uh, there's ways if you coordinate with your vets to get paperwork and have them do all the sending off to the lab and give you just a tidy little report that tells you what's adequate and what's not. It also gives you some information about parasites. Great way to do it. Or if you um, kill something for home kill, you can uh, talk to your veterinarian, find out what samples need to be taken, send those off to the lab through the vet clinic, and get some information about mineral status there. That's a little bit harder. We don't always have animals, especially in small lifestyle blocks, that are going uh, for slaughter on a regular basis. So then we turn to blood sampling can take it any time of the year. The animal doesn't need to uh, give too much of a sacrifice. It's pretty easy technically, and it gives us relatively good information, but sometimes it is a little bit indirect in what we're sampling. So it's not perfect. It's not our gold standard, such as liver analysis, but um, definitely still worth doing. And then if you're really expert and you're really into the chemistry, looking at your plants and soils is, uh, can be fun and interesting if that's your hobby um, and can be a good way to find out some more information when you get into the trickier problems. Uh, Kate was telling me that, that uh, there's a book she's editing on these topics. Uh, I defer to experts like that because it is so complex. The interaction of soils and plants and animals is fascinating and I've heard people give wonderful lectures on it and I don't remember any of it. So I always have to look it up or ask experts such as Kate or read her uh, ebook, which I think is supposed to be coming out. So there's a plug. I haven't read it yet myself, but um, I'm sure it's interesting if you like that kind of chemistry. And uh, So now we're just going to talk about a couple of these big usual suspects, the really common ones. I'm really just hitting the highlights for you because they're all very complex. Just take in this kind of light, superficial layer, and then if something uh, comes up in your animals, you can do a bit more in-depth investigation. Um, I'm sure my contact details for email is a great way to get a hold of me. You can email me questions, and I can try and send you some resources. Or if you're in the Waikato area, we can meet and, and do consults for sure. I'm happy to do that through the vet clinic um, uh, and just learn more. Magnesium is a big one. Uh, so I'm kind of skipping over the big, biggest ones, which is stuff like calcium, which calcium could be a whole lecture in itself. Um, and most people know a lot about calcium and, and low calcium levels in, in milking cattle. Um, we'll just leave that for another day. But magnesium is also very important. It's very interrelated with calcium. And usually when we get a magnesium deficiency, it's in spring. It's in fast growing grass. The grass is just sort of outgrowing its magnesium. Animals are unable to store magnesium in any real sufficient way that they can call on it in a hurry. And so they can get a deficiency quite quickly. And um, they get what's called spring tetany which is slightly different from grass tetany, uh, which is different from grass staggers. Um, but there's lots of names to complicate and confuse you. Animals with magnesium deficiency or the spring tetany will be very nervous and very twitchy. Um, and I've been told that it's kind of uh, indicative if they, if they die, unfortunately, if they are paddling when they die, um, magnesium, paddling is their legs kind of swimming in the air, but they're on their side, pardon me, <laughs> need to explain that. Um, swimming in the air, check magnesium levels, and uh, that can be done with, uh, with blood, even if the animal has died, um, and it can also be done with fluid from the eye um, if they've died too fast for you, um, up to about 24 hours, you can still check levels, and uh, being 
forewarned is forearmed, I think is the saying. Once you know about magnesium deficiency likelihood, it's very easy to, um, to manage in your animals. Uh, interestingly, because of the interaction of magnesium on the nervous system, so good levels of magnesium are calming to the nervous system, um, it's in a lot of the horse supplements that are sold as calming supplements. Some of them have other things, but magnesium is often in a lot of them. Uh, you need to take it in very large doses to have this calming effect. Um, but it's got a re some really interesting uh, interactions with the nervous system. And actually in human medicine, sometimes they use it um, for amazing things like uh, managing pain and chronic pain and hypertension in uh, women who are giving birth. And um, I wrote a big long paper that never got published. So if you're really interested in magnesium, uh, get my details and email me and we can talk at length. <laughs> so, so that we don't get too confused, we'll move on to the next big one, which is selenium. As I mentioned earlier, selenium can be both deficient quite easily and can get into toxicity. It's really important in the hair and the hooves and the skin. It's important in the immune system, especially in its interaction with vitamin E. Uh, together with vitamin E, they act as a strong antioxidant, so it scavenges free radicals, and free radicals are normally caused in the process of going about and being alive, and selenium helps reduce that. And when selenium isn't sufficient, especially in young animals, the antioxidants, or I'm sorry, the oxidants, the free radicals build up in the muscles because they have the highest metabolism, and we get white muscle disease, um, which is very characteristic of uh, selenium deficiency in animals. So uh, that's why it's important to check your selenium levels. We know that it's uh, deficient in pretty much all areas of New Zealand, and supplementing animals uh, at, at a low level of is always good and then checking levels when you're supplementing and seeing if you need more or less um, and that's quite easy. A whole blood uh, which a veterinarian can come and take blood without without too much uh, pain in, inflicted on your animals and send it to the lab. I just did this on my horse, found out that his supplementation was a little bit high um, so I backed off his supplementation and he's come a bit better. It's really, well it's not quite that simple but it can be that that easy, I suppose. Um, I don't want you to be scared by the complexity of minerals. I want you to give it a try, and and uh, and I think you can do a lot for the health of your animals. Copper is a big one we talk about in cattle. Maybe just because I've been working with a lot of commercial dairymen lately, we talk about cattle, copper in cattle, um, and it's often quite deficient in cattle. On the other hand, uh, too much copper can be very bad as well, um, and sheep are quite sensitive. Sheep, goats, and what we call camelids, which is uh, llamas and alpacas, can be very sensitive to excessive copper because it's an oxidant and it creates free radicals, and um, it can do damage to blood cells, but it's very important in energy and in hair and skin production. Copper is required for producing the black coloring in fur, and that's why we frequently get this copper deficient coat, which is very characteristic. Um, the animal's coat should be this nice, lovely, whoops, pardon me, I'll go back, um, this nice, lovely black, but instead it's this faded because there isn't enough copper to make the black pigment, um, and so the coat is, is lighter color than it should be. Now, not every time you see this, sometimes this is just sun bleaching, um, especially when it's just the tips, but it's, when it's this extensive, it's a copper deficiency. Um, in any case, you can always check copper fairly easily and, and find out. Zinc is another funny one, and it interacts with copper. So most people, if they're treating for facial eczema, uh, which is this photosensitization that sheep and cattle get very badly. Um, if you're treating for facial eczema, you're giving such high levels of zinc that we end up with copper deficiency and deficiency of some other minerals because they get tied up in the animal's rumen. Um, and so we have to give really high levels of zinc to prevent this sunburn from happening, but then we end up with deficiency of copper, and sometimes the zinc is so high <laughs> that we end up creating the toxicity, uh, especially when using things like boluses, 
uh, you can accidentally give an animal uh, two boluses or two loads of zinc. Um, really my advice for zinc, besides understanding that it's needed for facial eczema and it's involved with copper metabolism, is is check your levels and talk to uh, a veterinarian or an animal health expert or a nutritionist about where your supplementation levels should be because at different times of the year it will be different because of this facial eczema risk. And if you're not familiar yet with facial eczema, um, it's not uncommon. It's something that they talk about a lot in uh, conventional and commercial scale livestock farming. If you haven't learned it yet as a lifestyle block farmer, don't panic. Um, before December, ask your vet uh, because the season is the midst of summer. They'll give you an explanation and help you come up with a plan to protect your animals. It's a disease we want to protect from, not treat after it happens. So um, get on it. And now is the off season. So now is a good time to ask about it. Cobalt is an interesting one. We Cobalt is required for bacteria to produce this vitamin B12. Um, and so if cattle are not taking in an adequate amount of cobalt, because in some parts of New Zealand it's deficient in the soil, uh, they will not produce B12 vitamin, and they end up with a type of anemia called pernicious anemia, and uh, they just do very badly um, for a lot of reasons. Um, it was common, they called it, bush sickness in the early days of settling New Zealand because they came from the UK. They'd never seen cobalt deficiency before and cattle just had really ill thrift and they couldn't identify it and they couldn't identify it. Some areas of New Zealand, cobalt is adequate in the soils and the food uh, and the grass, but it gets tied up in the rumen um, because of those interactions with other minerals. So we check the B12 levels and we get an idea of whether the animal is effectively getting enough cobalt rather than measuring what's put into the animal uh, because that just really doesn't tell us the whole story. And again, it just underlines why uh, consulting with experts is important. And yes, it is complicated, so please don't be intimidated. Um, slowly you'll get it, keep reviewing. I think iodine is my last one here. Iodine's a bit interesting. If you have goats um, or sheep, you're more likely to run into iodine issues than with cattle. Iodine is required for the production of thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormone is required for normal development. Uh, it just runs all of metabolism. If there isn't enough iodine in the diet, um, animals will get a goiter because the thyroid is trying to produce thyroid hormone, doesn't have the iodine to attached to it and so swells because it's sitting there with all this no iodine thyroid hormone and it swells. We don't see deficiency, especially not this severe, uh, most of the time in, in New Zealand. Usually what we get is we get it in kids. We don't see it this severe in adults, pardon me. We usually have it in kids and lambs because um, sheep have enough or does have enough iodine for themselves, but there's an increased demand during pregnancy. Um, the kid or lambs don't get enough iodine while they're uh, fetuses before they're born. They end up having difficulty with birth, which we call a dystocia. That's what that fancy word is. Or they're born with uh, big fat goiters and they're weak and they don't grow well and sometimes die quite quickly. So if you're either seeing goiters or having weak kids looking at iodine, um, is a, a worthwhile pursuit in your sheep and goats. It does occur in cattle, just less often. It'd be kind of a bit unusual. So finally, here we are at uh, uh, our key points. I would recommend most people to use some sort of a good multi-mineral because uh, there are a lot of deficiencies out there. You can start feeding a multi-mineral and then do some testing in your animals uh, before trying to add multiple supplements. I really don't recommend giving multiple supplements, uh, commercially made supplements of any kind um, because you can get into excesses quite quickly, as I was saying with the selenium issues. Um, so read your labels and learn to look for what's in them before adding supplements on top of supplements. And this includes adding herbs. So those of you horse people out there or people showing goats or something, um, herbs can do great things for animals, but um, feeding herbs 
because they're a broadleaf plant, they tend to accumulate certain minerals, and so you can end up with uh, excesses and, and poisonings of minerals if you're feeding high doses of, of particular herbs. And oftentimes the more therapeutic and medicinal herbs are better at sequestering minerals, which is kind of why they're useful for certain therapies. Uh, so just consult, again, with experts, um, though a lot of veterinarians won't know about mineral levels in particular herbs. Um, do a little research, consult with an herbalist perhaps, find out what uh, minerals might be high in those nice leafy greens. I really recommend not to cross species with any of your supplements, be they mineral supplements or feeds. Um, examples of this are that horse supplements can poison sheep and goats because they're too high in copper. Um, alternatively, uh, sheep and goat feed or supplements would be insufficient uh, in copper for horses. So it's just not good either way. Uh, there are other issues besides minerals. Uh, cattle feed can contain these, these products called ionophores that are used to keep young cattle healthy. That can kill horses quite quickly, so keep your horses out of your cattle feed um, so we don't have any horrible tragedies. Uh, I also kind of dislike multi-species mixes. I've only seen them a couple times, but they're labeled, oh, put this out for all classes of livestock. I think you end up with everything either, they're so low in concentration, either everything's deficient or, um, or you have to give extra, and so somebody ends up with a toxicity or a poisoning, and uh, just feed your animals uh, their individual feeds. Don't try to cross species with um, stuff that's labeled for specific species. Of all the minerals, be the most careful with selenium, please. It's the easiest to screw up. Um, and I couldn't say either err on the side of too much or too little because both are quite dangerous. Um, I really like adding the vitamin E. Um, I think I, I don't think I said earlier, in America, we were taught always supplement uh, vitamin E with selenium. The two act synergistically together as antioxidants. Um, and you can get vitamin E just by increasing a little bit of oil in the feed of your animals. Um, and together they act. Oh, oh, oils, good omega fatty acids are an excellent anti-inflammatory antioxidant as well. So I really, I prescribe that a lot for animals that need an anti-inflammatory uh, dose for either skin issues or, or those kinds of things. Um, and finally, don't panic. It is complicated and ask an expert if you need help. Um, we're here to help and we're happy to, to serve you. Mm -hmm.